see you all out this morning again. For those of you who watch this online, just want to let you know that we will be having communion at the end of the message, and so you may want to get your emblems for that now. So this morning we continue where we left off last week, and we're talking about a difficult topic, but I think it's an issue that most can identify with, either from their own personal life or experiencing uh, or knowing somebody who has gone through a difficult time. And the title of the message is, When You Feel Like Giving Up. And so we did part one last week, and, and if you didn't hear that or see that, you can go to the Grimshaw Pentecostal Church YouTube channel, and you can find that there. And so today is the second part. If you don't have notes and you're here this morning, uh, there are some that Barb can get for you. So as we mentioned last week, there's something you've probably learned in life already, and that there's always something to deal with in life, isn't there? There's this challenge or there's that challenge. If it's not that one, it's another one. Maybe some of you, like us, have uh, recently been watching a new TV series. It's a celebrity survival TV show called Beyond the Edge. And uh, Beyond the Edge features nine celebrities trading their worlds of luxury to live in the dangerous jungles of Panama, where they face off in epic adventures and endure the most brutal conditions as they push themselves to go far beyond their comfort zone. This is the most intense celebrity adventure ever attempted, and uh, where only teamwork, perseverance, and finding the inner strength they never knew they possessed can actually get them through another day as they attempt to raise money for their chosen charities. And so during the day, they compete against each other for prize money, and then in the evening, they come together to talk about the day's events and the casualties of the competitions and the jungle. And then at the end of the evening gathering, a question is asked and the option given that anyone who has had enough can choose to ring the bell, quit the game, and go home. Well, after the first or second night, uh, Meta World Peace, an ex-basketball, professional basketball player, he was the first one to ring the bell. He was uh, extremely afear afraid of wild animals, and uh, since their makeshift beds were wide open to nature, he just didn't think he was going to be, be able to get any sleep at all. And so he rang the bell and went home. Second to leave was Lauren, who suffered a severe injury to her foot during one of the competitions, and as a result of the doctor's recommendations, she too had to ring the bell, quit the game, and go home. Well, next was Ebony, who suffered a severe tooth infection. Her cheek was extremely swollen for a couple of days. And again, under the doctor's recommendations, she too rang the bell. Well, they're a week into the two-week experience. And at the present time, as the show continues, Paulina, who's 56 years old and the oldest woman in the group, she's suffering severely with chronic joint pains. And now Jody has a double infection in both of her ears. And so both of these women said they feel very much like giving up, quitting the game, but they're trying to hang on to raise more money for their chosen charities. And like on that show, there's always something to deal with, isn't there? See, none of us are ever going to go through a problem-free life. There's always going to be something. Either you're just coming out of a challenge, or you're in the middle of the challenge, or you may not know it yet, but you're about to go into a new challenge. That's just what life is like, because... Honestly, life is a string of challenges. And as we deal with life's challenges, we realize that we battle on three different fronts. There's first the battle inside of you, and that's the battle with your own sinful nature. Secondly, there's the battle around you. That's the worldly influence 
the culture that tries to mold you into its own standard. And then thirdly, there's the battle against you. There's evil in this world. That's Satan. And he is out to destroy, steal, and kill. Well, looking at Hebrews chapter 11, it's the Heroes of Faith chapter, we identified three important principles that will help us with this topic to not give up when we feel like giving up. And so first we found faith doesn't spare us from pain. And so if you thought just being a Christian is going to keep you from all of life's severe distressing challenges, that's not what the Bible says. You can be even be doing the right thing and suffer for doing good. We see that example in Scripture. The second thing is some of God's promises and uh, it's said that there's about 7,000 promises in the Bible. Some of God's promises will not be fulfilled until eternity. And so if you're expecting everything to be done here and now, and you wonder, well, why isn't God doing this or fulfilling that in my life? Well, it tells us in chapter 11, some will not be fulfilled until eternity. And then thirdly, we realize the Bible says that you and I are running a historical relay race. All the people in Hebrews chapter 12 and all the people through the Bible, in fact, ran their particular race at their time that God had for them. And so then they passed the baton to the next generation and the next and the next. And now it's our turn. We presently carry the baton in the relay race, the Christian uh, relay race. Well, then we started uncovering the six keys on how to endure the tough spots of life that we all go through. And these are principles gleaned from the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 12, the first four verses. And last week we looked at the first three of these, which included, number one, I need to remember that heaven is watching me. The Bible tells us uh, that we have an audience in heaven and because they know life can be tough, in fact, their lives were much tougher than most of ours will ever be, and yet they found a way to make it to the finish line, they are cheering you on in your life and in your challenges. The second key is we must eliminate what doesn't matter in life. The Bible says that we are to lay aside the weights that so easily beset us, and so we need to declutter, and that's a good principle of life also. And then secondly, uh, under that same point, we need to regularly repent of the sin in our life because those things hold us back. They slow us down, and in fact, they can trap us and stop us dead. The third thing, the third key that we realized last week was, I've got to realize if I'm going to make it to the finish line, I need to run God's race for me. The scripture said there at the end of verse 2, it said, run the race God set for you. You know, a lot of other people would uh, try to make you run their race that they have for you. They'll put expectations on you. But we need to uh, learn what God's race for my life is. Well, how do we do that? Well, here's one way to do it. We use the acrostic, uh, the word shape. S stands for your spiritual gifts. Look at those. Uh, H stands for your heart. A for your abilities. P for your personality. And E for the experiences you go through, good and bad, and what you've learned from that. How has that shaped your character? And so, what am I gifted to do? What do I love to do? What am I talented to do? What does my personality fit with? What are my experiences, good and bad? And of course, what is God's Spirit leading me to do? And so that's how we uh, I come to understand how God has designed me for certain purposes along the way. All right, well, let's continue from there. Let's pick it up with point number four. The fourth key is this. I must focus on Jesus, not my circumstances. If I want to run the race well and finish the race, 
I must focus on Jesus, not my circumstances. So when you're going through a tough time, especially when you feel like throwing in the towel, you're at the end of the rope. You don't think you can hold on. You need to focus on Jesus. That is critical, not your circumstances. And it's tough. It's easy to say, but it's challenging to do when you're in the middle of some severe problem. But don't focus on the problem any more than you have to to make the appropriate decisions. Focus on the Savior, not the situation, but Jesus. And not other contestants, you'll be tempted to do that too. Don't look to see how other people are running the race. They're not you. They don't have the same race that God has set them on. Just get your eyes on Jesus. Verse 2 tells us how we run with endurance. It says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. From start to finish the whole way through. And so you may find in your life that periodically you focus on Jesus and then you drift and you get focused on uh, the life around you, you know, the world and its influence. Well, get refocused on Jesus regularly. So I don't know what you're going through right now, what tough issue you're dealing with. It may seem unendurable right now, and you might think, I don't know how long I can hang in there. I don't know if I can really handle this. So to endure the seemingly unendurable, we must keep our eyes on the invisible. It's really a spiritual act of faith that's going to allow us to endure. And so we must keep our eyes on Jesus and our faith in him. Now, how do you keep your eyes on someone who's invisible? Well, the two main components of the mind are this. We can envision or get a picture in our mind, and then we can think and process thoughts. And so what this is really saying is, it's what picture do you have of Jesus? What picture do you have of God the Father? Hopefully you've read the Bible enough to learn enough about him to get a mental picture and so when, you, when it says, put your eyes on Jesus, get that mental picture in your mind. And so focus your mind on Jesus and start thinking about what he means to you. That's what this means. As Corey Ten Boom said, uh, she's the author in the book of the book and movie, The Hiding Place. Perhaps you've heard of her. Uh, Corey and her sister Betsy were put into the Auschwitz prison during World War II for hiding Jews. They were caught, and, and so even as Christians, they were sent into the death camps along with the Jews that they were hiding. And uh, Betsy died there, but Corey actually survived. And uh, once she was out, she said this. She said, if you look to the world, you'll be depressed. And if you look at yourself within, you'll be deep. Sorry, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed because we run out of resources. But if you look to Christ, you'll be at rest, at rest. You know, the circumstances don't even have to change in your life. And you can have a peace that passes all understanding, a peace that doesn't make sense come over you and just help you relax and restore your hope. That's what she's talking about. If you've got your eyes on the problem, it's no wonder you're discouraged. It's no wonder you're unfocused. It's no wonder you feel like giving up. But if you've got your eyes focused on God, on Jesus, He is the Savior. He is the solution to our problem. He is your present help in times of trouble. No one else will do, but he will help you through. And so what do you do? Well, you remember what God has done for you. Remember God's goodness to you in the past. And you remember God's presence with you right now. And then you remember God's power is av available to you to face 
the future. And so you get your mind off yourself and keep from dwelling on the problem and redirect your focus to God. One of my favorite Bible verses is Jonah 2 verse 7. And you know the story of Jonah probably. God told him to go to Syria to a city named Nineveh and preach repentance to that city. But he said, I'm not doing that. And in fact, he went the, the exact opposite direction. Instead of going to Nineveh, he headed for the seacoast of Spain. And so he's, he's uh, going that direction. And God decided to plan a little Mediterranean cruise for him. And when the crew on the ship tried to figure out why are we having problems, why is a storm coming up, and the gods seem to be angry. And they realized, Jonah finally confessed, he said, I'm the sinner here, I'm going away from God's plan, you better throw me overboard. And so they did. And the uh, Bible says, God created a big fish to uh, swallow Jonah. Now, by the way, it doesn't say in the Bible a whale specifically, it just says a great fish. So it could have been a whale, but God created a great fish and had it ready to swallow Jonah. And then Jonah, when he's at the bottom of the sea in the great fish's belly, he says in chapter 2 of the book of Jonah, he prays this prayer of repentance. And it says in Jonah 2.7, it says, When I had lost all hope, I once again turned my thoughts to the Lord. In other words, he's, he did exactly what uh, Hebrews says we need to do. And so in our distressing times, that's what we need to do also. Now, some of us who grew up in church and probably heard the story of Jonah time after time, maybe dozens of times, you know, sometimes we can just hear those stories and they, they can just become like a storybook story. Something nice to hear. But that's not the purpose of why God's got it in the Bible. It's a principle for us to understand so that when we get into a predicament, a serious challenge, that we do the same thing Jonah did. We refocus our eyes on Jesus. And so he said, when I had lost all hope, Jonah said, I once again turned my thoughts to the Lord. The New King James Version says it like this, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And so when we too are in a distressing time, we need to refocus our thoughts, attention, and faith onto God, for He is the one who is truly able to help. Well, I want you to hear a more modern story, and this is a true story of a man named Rob, because it's an unusual and an amazing story, and it will also lead us into point number five. Rob is an MD, a doctor. He's a physician who lives in Minnesota, he had a private practice, he was a doctor at the Mayo Clinic, and he was married to a Harvard-trained attorney. And now he leads two online small groups for his church, and he has a couple of other ministries. But listen to some of his backstory. See, at nine years of age, Rob was in a car accident. His father was minister of music in a church in Anaheim. But the family was in a car accident where the car flipped and caught on fire, and his mother and his brother burned to death. And Rob had 40 degrees or 40% of his body that was burnt in that accident also. And so Rob was at a young age very familiar with pain and struggle. But when Rob grew up, he went ahead and got a doctorate and he went into practice as a physician. But then he got a very painful degenerative back disease, which left him totally incapacitated, 100% on disability, lying on his back all day long, every day. 
He thought that maybe God had given up on him. He was at that point where he felt like giving up. But then a Christian friend named Glenn said, Rob, why don't you start watching the Saddleback services online? I want you to hear Rob's perspective on his experience. And so this is back in 2010, and Rob said this. He said, for the past five years, I've been living my life flat on my back. Living like this with constant pain is not where I would have seen myself. See, my spine is literally falling apart. In the past 10 years, I've had four major surgeries on my spine, he said. After the major spinal reconstruction that we underwent at the Mayo Clinic, the surgeon came in and sat down with Chris, his wife, and I, and said I was going to be permanently disabled, and literally that I had to get used to the fact that I would no longer be able to continue my profession as a physician. Now that also reminds me of the Apostle Paul and what he said after he listed all the things that he went through in his missionary experience. And then at the end of them, he called them light afflictions. Well, getting back to Rob, Rob not only got into leading two online small groups eventually while lying flat on his back, but there's more. See, through his church, through an international ministry that they developed called the Peace Plan, Rob also goes to Rwanda online as a doctor's consultant. Doctors with difficult patients in Rwanda can contact U.S. physicians and ask questions about how to deliver the best care. And so Rob says, I meet with the physicians in Rwanda face-to-face -face online as they examine and talk about specific patients. And so God has given me a wonderful second chance to be able to share my faith and to help care for patients literally around the world using technology, being face-to-face -face with people that are out there in the trenches. Rob said, to see how God answered those prayers is amazing. He's taken me off the shelf dusted me off, and put me right back into action. All for his glory. Now, of course, in order for this to happen, Rob had to have a willing attitude, and he had to put effort into it from his side as well. And we need to understand we will always have a part. And so God did his part, and Rob did his part. In fact, Rob was so helpful in Rwanda on a daily basis that the government of Rwanda asked him to teach a cardiology seminar to their three major hospitals from his bed. And if that wasn't enough, in addition to that, Rob developed and serves as a consultant for a local Skid Row homeless clinic. And so Rob said, I thought my life was over, that God had put me on the shelf, but through online ministry, I now have an international ministry. He said, if I can lead uh, two online small groups and be part of a peace plan in Rwanda while confined to bed, God can use anybody. Now, just on the side here, an issue that's prevalent today in our world, assisted suicide. When a person is in a severe condition, it's normal from a human perspective to think the value of your life has ceased. And therefore, what's the point of living any longer? But God is the author of life, and he can do the unthinkable in a person's life. And we never know what and when that might be, or what it might look like. And so we must never play God and think that we know best when someone's life should be over. It's not for a Christian to help or to uh, lead to an assisted suicide approach. That is not the Christian way.
So that's the fourth key. When you are in the middle of the stressful time, focus on Jesus, not on the circumstances. Now the fifth step in overcoming discouragement is to do what Rob just did. Minimize the pain and maximize the profit. That's number five. Minimize the pain and maximize the profit. It's amazing how much pain or distress a person can actually go through when they're rightly focused on God and the ministry he has for you to do. You know, we can coast through life, have a really difficult experience that may last for a long time, and it's difficult just to focus on God and for things to turn around. You pretty much have to focus on the ministry that he still has for you. You know, in this world, we do what's called retirement. But there's no such word in the Bible. God never ends his purpose for your life until you die. And so, only when we focus on God and the ministry he has for us, Will our view change? Will our perspective change? Will we get a second wind? That's what, God, that's what Rob did in his situation. You know, we have to acknowledge that pain is pretty common in life. And just like there's pain getting into physical shape, for example, there's pain getting into spiritual shape. There's pain getting into your, getting your finances under control and getting out of debt. There's pain in anything that works in life that really matters. But instead of getting focused on the pain, which is so easy to do, we need to look to the long term. You need to look at the reward, the purpose. And so even when life can be challenging and painful, you need to minimize the pain in your focus and maximize the profit or the purpose God still has for you in the long term. Jesus did this. It says in verse 2, it says, Jesus was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. Notice, he's looking past short term. Even though he knew his situation would be very painful. And it was, even once he got into it, it's extremely painful and severe. And we know that it ultimately ended in death. A seemingly untimely death, an excruciating death, as he was crucified on the cross at the age of 33. But Jesus looked past all the pain he was presently going through, it says, and chose to look at the joy that would be his afterwards. So what was that joy that would be his afterwards? Well, he knew that his death on the cross would make possible salvation for you and for me. And really, it was the only thing that would. And so his suffering was totally for our benefit, not his own, but ours. That's called redemptive pain. Scripture says, And now he's seated in the place of highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. And so that was part of his afterwards also, to rejoin his Father in heaven. And so we've got to look past short-term thinking on anything that you want to change in your life and make it through that difficult period when you feel like giving up, you may feel like giving up on a marriage. You may want to give up on the dream you've carried inside. You may want to give up on a diet. You may want to give up on a job search. You may want to give up on adopting a baby. You may want to give up on you fill in the blank. You know what it is that you've been carrying inside. But what's needed is to minimize the pain, the fear, the discouragement, the doubt, whatever that is. 
And then we need to push through that time, however long that lasts. Minimize the pain in our thinking by seeing the eventual profit and purpose of our life. In other words, don't give the present struggle so much importance in your thoughts and in your life. Play it down in your thinking. Make it smaller by putting it into the perspective of your entire life. Play down the difficulty. Don't let yourself dwell on it. Make sure you don't amplify the hard part, as we are prone to do. And then play up the benefit of doing the right thing. For example, staying with the marriage and going and getting some counseling and working it out, as one example. See, it's always more rewarding to resolve and repair a relationship than to replace it. Always better to overcome the challenge than to avoid it and give up. There's no honor, there's no pride, there's no character in that. Let me give you an example of this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about the pain he's gone through in serving the Lord. Now, none of us uh, come close to his experience. He's talking about being a missionary, and he says, he says this, I've worked hard. I've been put in jail more often. I've been whipped more times without number. I've faced death again and again. Five times the Jews gave me 39 lashes. Imagine what that would have felt like and then what that would have looked like afterwards. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled many weary miles. I've faced dangers from flooded rivers and from robbers and dangers from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I've faced dangers in the cities and in the deserts and on the stormy seas. I've faced dangers from men who claim to be Christians but aren't. And I've lived with weariness and pain and sleepless nights. I've often been hungry and thirsty and gone many times without food. I've shivered from the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Obviously, that's a whole bunch of stuff for one person to go through. Then in the same book, we read in chapter 4, his evaluation of all his experiences that he went through. He says this, he said, in spite of all this, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, really, Paul, really, are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs the problems. When we are fulfilling God's purpose for us, even through distressing times, it gives us an enduring strength to carry on. Paul went through every challenge that came his way. He didn't avoid it. He didn't quit on it. But he did choose his perspective about his situation, about the problems and the rest of his life, very carefully and very intentionally. See, it's his perspective that allowed him to say what he did in 2 Corinthians 12.10, where he said, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproach, in needs, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For the purpose that Christ has given to me, I take pleasure in the challenges and the struggles I've faced. We, too, must choose that perspective, especially in distressing times. So you need to minimize the pain and maximize the profit and purpose of your life. The benefit, the reward, is first and foremost a matter of perspective. Now, we would tend to look at a life like Paul's and think of it as a disaster and 
perhaps even think that, well, God must not be with a person like that. But that's not what Scripture says. He says, and Paul said himself, he said, these light and momentary troubles are small potatoes compared to the reward I'm going to get in heaven. Now, by the way, how long is eternity? Forever, right? And what's it worth? What's it worth to you? It should be priceless. Priceless. Here's the next verse. Galatians 6, 9, it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now circle that phrase, at the proper time. We tend to want the proper time to be our time. In fact, you know, we want the answer to our problem now. We want to get out of the problem. Or yesterday, if possible. But God says, if you sow, and that's the theme just before this verse, you will reap in the proper time. See, this is the law of the harvest. There's always a waiting period between the time you sow a seed and the time you harvest, reap from that. You don't plant the seed of an apple tree one day and then eat its fruit the next. There's always a delay, a period of time that you have to wait. But with God, delay is not denial. Make sure you remember that. You will get to eat the fruit of what you sow. You just need to stay focused on the race God has set for you. So if you start planning some good habits in your life, plant the habit of a daily quiet time with God, spend time with God praying every day for a few minutes, reading the Bible for a few minutes, and just being quiet, listening to God's voice. If you plant that kind of seed, you're going to reap a harvest from that. If you plant the seed of tithing, you know, giving the first 10% back to God, you're going to reap a harvest. This is a law that God has put in place. According to Malachi 3, 10, and 11, God will pour out blessings upon the one who regularly tithes, and he will rebuke the devourer, that's Satan, the one who is out to steal, kill, and destroy, God will rebuke the devourer from destroying your harvest when you regularly tithe. Now, in practical terms, what does that mean? It means this. When you give God's tithe to the church, it becomes seed for blessing. Blessing might come back to you. It might come uh, as a blessing to someone else. 30, 60, and 100 fold, the Bible says. Plus, you also keep yourself under the protection of God's umbrella. But if you fail to do so, your money will probably go to the devil instead. When you remove yourself from God's blessing, you open yourself up to the enemy's reach in your life. Perhaps uh, more money will go into a vehicle repair or a house repair or perhaps you'll crash because you've moved yourself out from underneath the protection of God's umbrella. Or you will not hear God's direction for the best price on insurance or groceries or yard supplies or whatever else you need. See, what happens is this. If you close your ears to God on one issue, you'll miss hearing him on other issues also. Simple principles profoundly different outcomes. Or another example of sowing and reaping. If you plant a good seed of being kind to enemies and responding to evil with good and not criticizing back when people criticize you, that's a biblical principle. You're going to reap a good harvest. But it doesn't come until you've gone through the seasons. There's a length of time between sowing and reaping. Now, some of you right now, it's like you're in the summer and you're in the heat, uh, maybe of your spiritual life. 
Uh, someone else might be like you're in the fall and you look and all the leaves are falling off the trees and everything looks kind of barren. Spiritually speaking, you may even be in the winter of your life or situation right now with some issue. And it's cold and it's snowy and it's bleak and it's dark and there's no fruit to be seen. Hang on. <laughs> Keep hanging on. After winter, spring will come. After spring, summer will come. After sowing, the harvest will come. God promised it. It's his principle. He put that into place. Well-known pastor Rick Warren says, in 1981, the second year of Saddleback Church, that's a church he started in Orange County, California. He said, I went through an entire year of depression. I was overwhelmed with responsibilities of the church. I just thought, I'm so incompetent, and there's no way I can handle the responsibilities of this church. I was depressed for an entire year. He said, I couldn't figure out why God was letting me go through this, he said. I was praying and I was staying close to him, but it was just a tough year. Every Saturday before preparing to come to Sunday services, I would drive down to Laguna Beach, sit on the cliffs, and watch the ocean. He said, I did that for a year. And I learned a truth that year. The tide goes out but it always comes back in. The tide goes out, but it always comes back in. See, when the tide is out, the beach looks ugly. There's driftwood and there's junk and stuff all over the place. It's not very attractive. The tide may seem to be out in your life right now. Maybe you're out of work, you're out of hope, you're out of money. The tide is out in your life. You're out of energy. Whatever it is, hang on. Hang on. The tide will come back in. Galatians said, let us not grow weary in doing good. There's your ministry. You're doing good. For we all reap a harvest if we do not give up. And so this morning, I encourage you to keep on keeping on with God's help. Okay, that's point number five. Minimize the pain, focus on the profit, the harvest, the reward, the purpose God has for your life. There's one other thing you need to do that will help you hold on, and this is going to be brief. Number six, you remember, you think about, what Jesus did for you. What Jesus did for you. So when you're going through a tough time, remember the tough times Jesus went through and think about the fact that he did this totally and solely for you. Not for himself. I try to think about that often for myself. What Jesus went through for me. The attacks he went through, the criticisms he went through. I think about the abuse and the cruelty he went through for my sake. The meanness, the torture, the ridicule, the painful death that Jesus went through. All so that I could be forgiven so that I can have a personal relationship with him and so that I can ultimately go to heaven. He did it for me, and he did it for you. Hebrews 12, verses 3 and 4 says this, Think about all that he endured when sinful people did such terrible things to him so that you don't become weary and give up. After all, 
you have not yet given up your lives in your struggle against sin. In other words, you're no martyr. You haven't given up your life for the sake of other people. You haven't yet shed your blood. You haven't died. In other words, Jesus went through a whole lot more for us than we could ever go through for him. And that's what communion is all about. Remembering Jesus. Remembering what he did and why he did it. And to remember his life was not easy, but filled with challenge. Ridicule, false accusations, pain, agony, and suffering. And yet he was willing to endure and run his race to the finish line for our sakes. And so we remember the cross and the resurrection, which made it possible for us to have forgiveness of sin. It made the Holy Spirit's empowering in our lives possible. And it made the reality of eternal life with God possible. As Barb and Barry hand out the communion emblems this morning, it says, When the hour had come, he sat down and the disciples with him. And then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this, divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of that fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And so Jesus lived his earthly life, went to an early death so that we could have sins forgiven. All the things that he went through, if he would have never made it to the cross or if he would have pulled out, you know, we see the most excruciating moment just before the cross when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he, and he prays, Father, if there's another way, please take this cup away from me. But he was willing to carry through. And then as he hung on the cross, at that moment, he literally took all of the sin of the entire world. I don't think we can fathom that. Not just as a weight, but as a weight but all the emotional effect of sin was put on him at that moment on the cross when he felt the Father pull away and he felt forsaken by his presence. See, holiness and sin cannot reside at the same place at the same time. And so he said, why have you forsaken me? And the sin laid so heavy upon him. Ultimately, he said, I give up my spirit. I realize there has to be a perfect sacrifice, and I'm willing to be that person. And so he died so that we could have life. Let's give thanks for what he did. Jesus, we're so thankful that you didn't quit your race. Even when it was extremely tough, you looked to the Father and the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to make it to the very end because you knew the importance, as Hebrews said, for the joy that would be yours and ours afterwards. You endured the cross. And so even though your body 
went through so much torment, you endured it for our sakes. We give you thanks for that as we remember this morning. Let's partake of the bread together. The scripture says <clears throat> the cup represents a new covenant that Jesus made with all who would believe. And this covenant represents the blood of Christ that was shed on our behalf in which we find power to overcome our struggles. And also part of that covenant is the Holy Spirit is placed inside every believer at the point of conversion to help us have wisdom and guidance and help and comfort and knowledge and strength, all the things we need to end your life, whatever that might be. Let's give thanks for Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus, you were never at the mercy of humans, but you did allow them to fulfill the crucifixion because again, you knew that a perfect lamb had to be slain to have forgiveness of sin. Thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross, gave up your life willingly. And you will not only forgive us sin, but you'll protect us by the blood. Because of the resurrection, that blood has power. And so now, when we are in you, your blood gives us power. And as the good shepherd, one day you will ultimately lead us to also be with the Father. Let's partake of the cup together. So let me sum up what I'm saying. The problems that you go through in life, these are tests. And James 1 talks about that also. You know, it's easy to trust God when things are going great, isn't it? It's when life is tough. That's the real test of our faith. It's when we don't feel close to God because the problem is so severe. That's when real faith shows up. And we're reminded of the danger of the absence of faith, especially in the end times, when we read Luke 18.8, which says, when the Son of Man returns, when Jesus comes back, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? And so here's the question. When you're going through distressing times, will you still trust God? Will you do the right thing even though you don't feel like doing it? Will you do the right thing even though it doesn't make sense to you sometimes? Will you endure to the finish line, as Scripture calls you to? Will you finish well, or will you stop in the middle of the race and walk over to the sideline? Will you ring the bell and quit? Now, for you to respond to this message, I'm going to leave you with a question that will set you up to take a clear action. Might not make sense at first, so I'll explain it. And here it is. What have you started in your life that you need to finish? What have you started that you need to finish? The Bible calls all believers to run the race well and to finish the race. Remember, when you're feeling like giving up, one of the keys is to get your eyes off the problem and on to Jesus, to refocus and to have a spiritual perspective. And so I encourage you to do that with this question. What have you started that you need to finish? I'm calling you to get back in the race or to make sure you stay in the race. See, a year before Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthians, the Corinthian church had made a financial commitment to give money to help the church at Jerusalem. But a year later, they still hadn't given it. And Paul writes them a letter, and he says this. He says, you know, you guys need to finish what you start. You made a commitment to give, and now you need to finish what you've started. 
says in 2 Corinthians 8, 10, and 11, it says, finish what you started a year ago, for you were the first to begin doing something about it. Now you should carry this project through to completion just as enthusiastically as you began it. Give whatever you can according to what you have. And so let me go back and ask that question again. What commitments have you made that you may need to complete? Maybe you made a commitment to finish school and didn't do that. Maybe you made a commitment to get out of debt and you got tired and gave up on it and haven't done that yet. Maybe you've intended to be baptized and you've never yet been baptized. Maybe you, uh, maybe it's about your daily time with God. You started it and at some point it fell by the wayside and you need to pick it up again and continue it to the finish line. And you may have told someone of your commitment or you may have just held it inside and it's only known by you and God because God knows all things. But as you think about that question, something will come to mind. So remember, whatever it is that you need to keep on keeping on with, you've been called to run your leg in the big relay race of Christianity. Run your race. Run it well. Run it to the very end. And so what have you started that you need to finish? Whatever it is, God will tell you this morning. He will remind you of what's been left in your life uncompleted. And chances are, it may be something he's called you to do. And so I'd like you to bow your heads right now, and I want you to talk to God. I want you to ask God, God, what do I need to complete that I've started? Just ask him that. I dare you to. Ask God, what do I need to complete that I've started? What have I had the intention to do, but I haven't done it yet? What have I given up on that I should finish? And so with your head bowed, I'm going to pray for you. But I want to encourage you to write down that one thing on your outline. Write it down so you don't forget. What's the one thing you need to complete? A commitment that you've made that you haven't been faithful to complete yet. Or maybe even a couple of things. Let's pray. Father, you know how easy it is for us to get discouraged and to get distracted. You know our very hearts. And you know how easy it is when times get tough or things get lean and we don't feel the initial emotion of the starting of something. We get discouraged. We get distracted. We get doubtful. We get in despair. And so today, Lord, I pray that we will take these steps we've talked about and that you will help us with that. And so now as I continue to pray, just personalize this message. Be a doer of what we talked about, not a hearer only. And in your heart as I pray, say something like this to God. Lord, help me to remember that heaven is watching me. That there's a crowd of witnesses watching my life who've been down that road before. And they made it to the finish line. And I want to make it to the finish line. Help me, Lord. Jesus, help me to eliminate whatever doesn't matter in my life. All those things that are just weights that distract me and weigh me down and keep me from doing what I really should do. Help me, Lord, to be aware of and lay aside and not give in to the sins that catch me in a trap and keep me from doing much better things that you have planned for me. I want to run the race that you have for me, not someone else's ideas for me. Help me to see clearly the race that you have set before me. I want to be what you made me to be. Help me not to care so much about the approval of others. 
Help me to focus on you, Jesus, not my problems, not my circumstances, not the difficulty, but on you. And help me to minimize the pain by what by what my mind is focused on, and to adjust my perspective to focus on the rewards and to see your purpose for my life, understanding there will be a harvest. Help me to be like Jesus, who looked past the cross to see the joy on the other side. And most of all, Jesus, I want to remember what you did for me. I would not be alive without you. I would not be saved without you. I would not be forgiven nor headed to heaven without the pain that you went through right to the finish line. Thank you, Jesus. So now take a minute and write down those one or two things that the Holy Spirit has brought back to your mind, either through some words or through a picture that appeared in your mind as we were praying. Just write those down. Now finally, if you're hearing this message, but you've never asked Jesus Christ into your life, this is your opportunity. You can pray something like this. What matters is the sincerity of your heart, not the exact words. Just pray, Jesus, forgive my sins. I know I've done wrong. Please come into my life right now. I want to have hope instead of discouragement and despair. I want to trust you and do what the Bible teaches me to do. I want to come to know the plan you have for me. And I want to learn to love you from this day forward. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to affirm to everyone this morning that God heard your heart's prayer this morning. And he will help you with those issues as you continue with them. He will help you run your race and to finish well. Now, if you've invited Jesus into your life for the first time this morning, congratulations for your choice to do that. And I want to encourage you, you've started a brand new life, a spiritual new birth that's really given you the opportunity to live a brand new life. And I encourage you to do the following things. Find another Christian and tell them what you've done. Set aside some time each day to read the Bible and pray. Talk to God and then find a Bible-believing church and attend it regularly. God will bless you. Well, this brings us to the end of the message and the end of the service this morning. It's been a joy to be together. And so as we part, may the Lord bless you, keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go with that peace. Lord bless you.